Okay, thank you. Uh, thanks also. Thanks, I haven't said anything yet. Um, so I'll, uh, I was asked to talk a little bit about uh, conformal field theories and uh, a topic, a line of research that's now known as the, as the conformal bootstrap. I'm not sure this, this microphone. Okay, so uh, conformal field theories and uh, the bootstrap. Um, let me first of all say that I'm not the first to talk about this, uh, uh, this topic. So, in fact, I have many predecessors. Um, there are some great lectures by uh, Slava um, and by David Simmons Duffin um, that are available as lecture notes on the archive. For David, if you Google, there are also videos. Um, and then there are a lot of recorded lectures also by these people, um, which you can find if you go to YouTube and then look at um, the username or uh, Simon's Bootstrap collaboration. And that's the user, YouTube user that uploaded all of these videos. So you can learn a lot from, um, from those. What I'll try to do is give you in the time that I have a bit of a um, sort of summary from, from, from these lecture series. So each of those were like three, four lectures maybe. Um, and I'll just condense them into my single four lecture, uh, single number of four lectures. The single set of four lectures. So what I'd like to start with is um, a little bit of motivations. For um, why we would be interested in studying conformal field theories. So um, I'll give you a definition of conformal field theories much later. Maybe at the end of this lecture, maybe sometime in the second lectures. Um, for now, uh, let me just talk a little bit about physical systems and um, discuss the kind of sort of long distance behavior that you can get and um, then highlight which of these possible long distance behaviors you might be interested in. And uh, then we'll analyze that a little bit, what kind of physics you, you may expect there. And this will lead me eventually to um, this notion of a conformal field theory. So for now, conformal field theories are just some class of, of quantum field theories that I'll specify, whose, whose details I'll specify uh, later. Um, so uh, what is then the main motivation uh, for studying conformal field theories? Well, it's um, the physics of a quantum system, so something that is often described by, by some quantum field theory. Um, and what you may be interested in, what we're very often actually interested in, is the physics at very long distances or the physics at very low energy, the physics in the deep infrared. So let's say the physics at long distances. So you start with some, some small microscop some small scale microscopic description. This is very often the case where either your microscopic description is some UV quantum field theory characterized maybe by some path integral. I mean, this is a very schematic way of defining a quantum field theory. Something like this, some integral over field chi with some action weighted, so the field configurations are weighted with some e to the minus some action, uh, which depends of course on the field chi and then maybe on some couplings g, some renormalization skill mu, um, and something like that. Or maybe your microscopic description is not a QFT. It could be, for example, a lattice. Um, so you have some lattice, and at every lattice site there is some finite, say, number of degrees of freedom, some spins maybe that point up or down, like in the Ising model. And then the thing you're interested in is the behavior can be captured by the partition function which is some sum over all spin configurations weighted with, um, in this case, e to the minus beta h, where h is some Hamiltonian, which depends on um, the individual possible spins. So sigma i labels the spin configurations at, at site i, and um, you have a partition function like so in statistical mechanics. So these are just two possible microscopic descriptions of your systems, but in need of your physical quantum, quantum many body system. But in either case, you can ask what happens if I take this microscopic description, here I have some lattice spacing A, I should say, 
And I take this um, and I zoom out to the longest possible distances. So um, in the lattice system, I would say I would send my lattice spacing A to zero. Here, I would send my renormalization scale mu to infinity. Or more generally, you consider very low energy processes. So the energy of the processes that you consider um, goes to zero. And the question then, you, what you can ask is what happens at these very longest distances, in particular, what is the local physics? It could be that you have some topological degrees of freedom um, that, that you cannot measure locally, but only sort of globally. Um, that's not something I'll talk about. I'll just talk, ask what, is, what could the, the local physics be possibly at the very longest of distance scales? So there are various answers, possible answers to this question, and there are basically three uh, classifications for the physics at the longest distances. One is that the local physics is trivial. Um, so this is when the theory has only massive particles. So there's a mass gap. Your lowest energy state is the vacuum. And then your first excited state is, um, say in flat space, has finite energy. And so if I send my energy to zero, I can basically never get to this first excited state. And I see nothing. I see only the vacuum that's left. So there are no local degrees of freedom. as the energy goes to zero. So there are various examples, of course. Um, maybe I should ask you a question. Uh, what are good examples? What's the, typical, what's the stereotypical example for a theory with a mass gap? Young Mills. People say QCD. QCD is a dangerous thing to say here. So let's just do Young Mills theory with no um, um, <coughs> with no quarks. So the massive degrees of freedom are glue balls, the beta function is negative, and so um, what you find is uh, a confining theory with, with massive. What we believe is that this theory confines and the only massive particles are left at low energy. Uh, you could say QCD, but then without chiral symmetry. So a real world QCD if you want, where the pions actually have a mass. Um, <coughs> And um, let's, let's mention an example of a lattice system, so something like Ising. The Ising lattice system, so the Ising model in a sufficiently large dimension for, for most values of the temperature beta, or the inverse temperature beta. And so what, what you find if you, if you, in these theories, if you uh, look at the very longest distances, is that if you look at correlation functions in particular, let's take two operators in the theory, two local operators. They could be spin operators here defined on the lattice. They could be some operators expressed in terms of these elementary fields chi. And if you take these two operators and you look at very long distances, you see that they fall off exponentially with the power that's related to the, to the mass gap in the theory. OK, so uh, this was the um, first possibility, which of course is well known. Um, there is another one, which um, I'd like to briefly mention, and then a third one, which is all about, which is where we'll find conformal field theories, or really non-trivial conformal field theories. So um, the second answer. And that would be, for example, QCD with chiral symmetry. So my question, my second answer was uh, massless free particles. So massless free particles. You find those sometimes at low, low energies. So, um, uh, so your typical, for example, if the free particle that you find is a scalar, your Lagrangian is something like this. Free, scalar, Lagrangian, it's massless, and then maybe you have some interactions, but they're all irrelevant uh, in the renormalization group sense. So at the very longest distances, all you see is free particles. So um, examples of this in um, uh, in. Uh, well, in the world of quantum field theories are, for example, QCD 
with chiral symmetry, where the chiral symmetry exists at the microscopic level in the Lagrangian, but of course is broken spontaneously, and then at low energy, at low energies, you only see the Goldstone bosons. The Goldstone bosons do interact a little bit, but at the very longest distances, um, there's no interaction left. The interactions are famously um, irrelevant, and so, um, and so, basically, a th any, basically anything with um, with the spontaneous breaking of a continuous symmetry in more than two space-time dimensions falls into this class. There's another example, which is, um, let's, for example, four-dimensional QED, to the extent that it's a quantum field theory, um, at long, since it has a positive beta function, um, it becomes infrared-free and at the longest distances. What we see in this case are uh, free photons and maybe free fermions if they're massless. So typical, um, if you look at correlation functions of, of local operators like we did over there, what you'll find is that, well, let's, let's take this theory, free scalar, free massless scalar. Um, I can look at the two-point function of, say, the field phi itself, but that's a bit boring because, um, <coughs> because that is, is a bit too simple. So just to illustrate what I mean with composite operators, let me look at the phi squared, normal ordered, phi squared, normal ordered, one inserted at x, one inserted at y, and you can easily, by Weeks theorem, convince yourself that in d dimensions, let me see if I got the power right, so um, 1 over x minus y to the power 2 times uh, d minus 2. And what you'll find here, typically, is that if you look at correlation functions of local operators, you'll find um, that these are integer, or maybe half integer, power law. They decay as integer power law, or maybe half integer power laws, I think. Uh, no, it's often the integers. Integer power laws in, uh, at very large, large distances. So you get very different behavior from this, which was exponential behavior. Um, it's a power law behavior. It falls off much, much slower, but it's very typical that it falls off with an integer power. And then there's a third option, which is maybe not the first thing you learn in, um, if you learn quantum field theory, but it's an important option, and it's the thing I'd like to talk about um, in the rest of the lectures, which is that you get some interacting scale invariant QFT. And um, <coughs> um, so this is a quantum field theory where you cannot really, you have interactions, they may be strong. It's often hard to talk about, about um, particles in this theory. There's just some scale invariant um, uh, degrees of freedom. So the school is about strings, particles, and cosmology, and I think I won't be talking about either of these three things. Uh, but still, I think conformal field theories, these interacting scale invariant systems, are super interesting um, for all of these three topics, in fact. Um, so how could you get an interacting scale invariant system? Well, the most typical example, or a sort of a standard example, is a theory where your beta function is, has a zero, um, at some non-trivial coupling. So, for example, you can take SUNC, Young-Mills, with uh, NF fundamental flavors. And your beta function is, of course, uh, minus G cubed with some coefficients, which depends on NC and NF. And then there's a higher order term, which is, let me call it B1, which also depends on NC and NF, G to the fifth. And then, of course, there are infinitely many more terms. Um, so if you plot this thing, it looks a bit like this. The beta function starts out negative, but for sufficiently large G, it becomes positive. And so here, my coupling tends to increase. So this is beta. Here it tends to decrease. And here I have a fixed point at a non-zero value of the coupling. Now, of course, this is all very crude because I 
Um, I've completely ignored the higher order terms. What happens, maybe they, they'll just completely kill this fixed point and um, it doesn't exist in reality. But if you take and see very large, and an f very large, and you do it in such a way that um, their ratio is, um, is constant, then um, um, this theory, this thing does become reliable. This fi fixed point happens at very weak coupling, and you can do um, a more refined analysis to show that all these subleading terms are completely unimportant for the analysis of this fixed point. And so it just becomes completely reliable. And in this large n limit, you get something called the bang sachs it's called a fixed point of the renormalization group flow. So you can do a more detailed analysis. It requires you to compute the one and two loop beta function. But if you do these things as a function of NC and NF, you can show that um, um, the, the fixed point appears at very weak coupling. Um, I don't think that's necessary, but I'm not entirely sure. Um, yes. OK, um, there are other examples. So this is just one example of a theory with zero beta function. You can also um, uh, do uh, something simple, like lambda phi 4 theory. Um, Let's do it in three dimensions, where the classical beta function is uh, negative, so this theory, the coupling increases if you go to low distances. And um, so generically, it actually falls into the first class. The theory just becomes gapped, and uh, there are no degrees of freedom left at the longest distances. But um, if you tune the coupling to a so-called critical value in units of the mass, of the theory, then um, at, at precisely one value of the coupling, uh, you find actually such um, uh, interacting scale invariant theory. Um, and um, of course, the Ising model also at critical coupling. Um, is also an example of such a scale invariant interacting system. So what is the long distance behavior of um, correlation functions in, this, in these kind of models? Well, you can do a little bit of a, a crude analysis using the kalan zimantic equation. So you can say, well, let's look at the kalan zimantic equation, set the beta function to zero. Um, let's see, I don't want to give all the details here, but you can do it as an exercise. So, uh, Colin Simansic plus a bit of dimensional analysis will give you the long distance behavior, the power law behavior of um, correlation functions to be something like 1 over x minus y to the power 2 times delta 0, where delta 0 is the engineering, the scaling dimension of the operator in the UV. And then you get an extra gamma, which is the anomalous dimension in the exponent. And this is, of course, generically, for a generic operator, the anomalous dimension is non-zero. It's some non-trivial function of the coupling. And so what you get is here, this may be an integer. If this is something like the field phi or the field phi squared, it's often an integer power. But this gamma can be some random number, uh, some very complicated number. And so we get um, non-integer power law, generically non-integer power law decays. So if you do an experiment on some quantum many body system and you find this power law decays with some non-integer powers, then that's a good indication um, that you're looking at some interacting scale invariant quantum field theory. Uh, 
let's see. Oh yes, I want to say one more thing about these things. So, um, <coughs> so the question is, of course, how would you, why are we interested in these kind of correlation functions? And let me say one thing about, for example, the critical point of easing, um, or maybe the critical point even of, of boiling water at, at very high temperatures and, and very high pressures, there's also a second order phase transition there. Um, you, can, you can use um, do a renormalization group analysis to show that these deltas, these powers, so this whole thing, delta naught plus gamma, let me call it delta, um, these deltas, they are directly observable actually from macroscopic properties of the system because you can do a renormalization group analysis that tells you that, for example, if you look at the specific heat of, say, um, water um, or, or this easing system at finite temperature, um, uh, as a function of temperature, you'll find that precisely at the critical temperature, uh, the specific heat diverges and in your idealist system. And um, in fact, it diverges. So if this is your critical temperature, um, <coughs> with some kind of power law, with some exponent alpha. And as it happens, this alpha here is, again, using some renormalization group analysis, uh, related to the scaling dimension of, um, of one operator, the operator that I call epsilon here, I'm not going to go into details about what it means, but um, um, through this simple rational formula. So for example, you can do an experiment, you measure the specific heat, of course, it will never exactly be infinity because you have finite size effects and you have all kinds of microscopic effects interfering, but um, you will see this, this power law and you can fit a power to it and you can measure, for example, that alpha is approximately 0.11. And that will tell you, at least in three space-time, in three, in three dimensions. And that will tell you that this delta epsilon, if you plug it in, should be approximately um, 1.41. So it's very nice to know these, these scaling dimensions, at least of a few operators, so that we can predict the outcome of experiments that measure, for example, the specific heat. So what we will set out to do is we'll try to see what we can say about interacting scaling, scale invariant quantum field theories in full generality without resorting to any sort of microscopic description. Um, we'll just use symmetries and a little bit of thought to analyze um, these kind of field theories, see what the form of the correlation functions is, find in particular these non-integer powers, and see if we can say something about these powers so that we can, of course, relate it to experimental uh, outcomes. So that is the plan uh, for the remainder of the lectures. Any questions at this point? This was just a bit of motivation, very qualitative. OK. Um, then let's plunge into more technical matters. So let's discuss, um, well, we have to we are, we are given relatively little to work with here, right? What we're given is that we have some system that is invariant in particular under scale transformations, but I'll also assume that, it's in, that it has the usual relativistic invariance. In fact, we'll work in Euclidean signature. So I'll assume that it has the usual translation and rotation uh, symmetries that you get in Euclidean signature. So translations, rotations, and um, scale invariance at this point. Um, maybe we'd also like to say that it's local, so, so we have some kind of um, a stress tensor. But um, all of that um, uh, we should discuss later. Oh, I see that I miss a page at this point. Let's see. So we have these symmetries. So how do we 
what can we do with these symmetries and how do we relate it to, um, to, to correlation functions? So what we'll be interested in is correlation functions correlation functions of local operators I am in, in D dimensions Euclidean uh, scale invariant quantum field theory. So let's for the moment assume that we have some kind of path integral prescription, although it's not really necessary to, um, to go into, um, to assume this, but let's do it because it's very convenient. So then we write something like this. So we have i which labels the different operators. So we switch on sources for these operators. We have our path integral, d chi uh, e to the minus s chi minus the integral j, or I call them o i phi i. And um, I've also switched on uh, a background metric, g mu nu. So things do depend a little bit on the metric. Uh, here there's a square root g, so now everything is nicely covariant, ddx, like so. Okay, so let's assume this is, uh, this is our microscopic description of the system, and um, I've just packaged all these correlation functions into to some generating functional, right? We just take functional derivatives with respect to the source, phi i, which are some classical sources, and then every derivative that I take with respect to phi i brings down an OI, and so I can generate these correlation functions from um, functional derivatives of this partition function. Also, I should say that this I is really some kind of multi-index. Multi so um, I'm just packaging things like vector indices, spinner indices, but also flavor indices, some index that labels all the different operators into some capital I, which um, could mean many different things here. I hope it's not too confusing in, uh, in the remainder of, uh, of the talk. So what do we know? Well, we have the theory. So the theory now has some, some non-trivial background. So it lives, so this is a correlation function on some non-trivial metric. So really there's some space, some manifold, M maybe with some insertion point, x1, x2, all the way to xn. And we're just looking at this correlation function in the presence of some background metric g mu. So clearly this is some, some kind of fully covariant thing, so we can just um, do diffeomorphisms and those should not change the answer. So this partition function, so whether we compute this in say in flat space, whether we compute this in Cartesian coordinates or in polar coordinates, that should not change our answer, right? So we have the important constraints of diff invariance. <coughs> which is that if I do a little diffeomorphism, so I send my coordinates x mu to x mu plus xi mu, where xi mu is an arbitrary vector field, then um, if I change the metric and the sources appropriately, then the partition function should not change. So what is the appropriate change of the metric? Well, Mukund already mentioned this in his lecture, so the change in the, in the metric is um, just like this. It's basically the lead derivative for a uh, second, for, for, well, for the particular case of the metric. Um, my source phi i changes with the lead derivative, so this is the symbol for the lead derivative of, um, of phi i. So for example, for a scalar, the lead derivative is of course just psi, psi mu d mu phi. For a vector, um, the lead derivative is that plus or minus some other term. I think it's minus here. Uh, yeah, it should be minus. Um, <coughs> D rho um, say, uh, what are we doing? V rho, like so. 
Right? This is just for the leader derivative, and you can define it for any tensor. In fact, you can also define it for spinners. Um, so fields, they change by their leader derivative. And my partition function better be invariant under this. So I get something like delta z, which is just a change of um, z with respect to the metric, delta g plus delta z delta phi times delta phi i um, better be 0. So this is a constraint. It's a bit of a boring constraint because it's just diff invariance, but it's a constraint on, uh, on this partition function. Um, now, what is the change of the partition function with respect to the metric? With respect to the source, that bit is the easy bit, right? Because if you change with respect to the source, we'll just insert an operator. We'll just bring this part down. If you change with the metric, we'll also change this action here. So we'll have to define something called the stress tensor, which is defined to be the variation of the action with respect to the metric. Let me put its indices like so. And then there's some simple factor two by convention and a one over square root of g to make it a proper tensor and not some kind of density. So for example, I wrote down the free scalar action and you can easily couple that to, curved, um, to, to curvature, make it, or put it in curved space is what I should say, couple it uh, to some non-trivial metric and uh, you can compute the derivative with respect to the metric and that will give you the stress tensor for say the free massless scalar theory. But more generally, this is just the way I can define the stress tensor. So with this definition at hand, I can just plug in all the equations that I wrote so far, and I get that zero is equal to dz dg mu nu. Well, that is, um, that will give me a stress tensor times the change of g mu nu. So that is something like box mu psi nu square root g t mu nu. And then um, let me also differentiate a bunch more times with respect to phi, so I get some kind of correlation function, O i1 to O i n. So this is of course at x, this is at x, and this integral is over x. So that's what the first bit gives me, and um, the second bit, well you have to be a little bit careful if I change the metric, I also change this metric determinant that sits here in front, um, I change phi with respect to the lead derivative, all of that combines basically to give me the lead derivative on uh, the operator. I think there's an extra sign here, um, which is a little hard to deduce without my notes, but I think it's an extra sign. And so you get, uh, yeah, in the end you should get something like this. Um, and then you get the sum for each of these operators, you get their lead derivative. So if these are at y1 to yn, you get the lead derivative i equals 1 to n. Um, then you have the usual correlation function, except that you act with the lead derivative on operator oii. Like so. So this is just the constraint of diff invariance. It's just the boring constraints that it doesn't matter in which coordinate a system you express your correlation functions. Now, that's okay. So what it does for us, it tells us that, well, we can just, the insertion of a stress tensor and then integrate it against this two tensor um, covariant derivative of psi um, gives us just, what it does effectively is it does, it takes every operator and transforms it with the lead derivative. That's a little boring. We can, be, uh, we can do something more interesting, however, if we can get rid of this first term and then we have some constraint of correlation functions. So the way to get rid of this first term is of course to consider a killing vector. We have that um, by definition, this first term vanishes. So those are nice vector fields because for those vector fields this first bit vanishes and um, we just get the second bit um, which is, let me call this 
2, we just get 2 equals 0. So for example, if you're in flat space, Well, I have a very obvious killing vector field, or set of killing vector fields, which are just the tra constant vector fields in any directions. Those give me the translations. So we can take psi mu equals a mu, some kind of constant vector field. And this will give me a constraint on correlation functions, which comes from translations. Um, which gives that, um, well, if this 2 depends on Xi, okay, I'm not going to write 2 again, so 2 for Xi mu, then we get 2 as a function of A mu is equal to 0. <coughs> um, did I do this correctly? There is one puzzle, no. Um, I should not have an integral here because there's no x in, in here anymore. So, th sorry, this integral should not be here. And you can, you can easily do this yourself because you can just take those functional derivatives like so and then differentiate a bunch more times with respect to the sources to get this, this constraint to correlation function. So, in particular, you can try to see if there's a minus sign mistake in the equation that I just wrote. Um, so this gives me um, a constraint, a non-integrated constraint for uh, correlation functions. And so, for example, this looks a bit abstract. Let's go to a concrete um, uh, correlation function. So for a correlator of two scalars, we have an operator of x, an operator sitting at x, an operator sitting at y, we can give, make them different, O1 and O2, we get the constraint that um, a mu d dx mu plus a mu d dy mu of this correlation function is zero. In other words, um, this for function g of xy is really just a function of the difference x minus y. And so this is what the constraint of, of, um, of translation invariance gives you. And of course, there's another killing vector field, um, or a bunch of other killing vector fields, which is associated to the rotations in flat space. So we can also consider those, and we will get, um, so this is one, and uh, we get the second one, psi mu equals m mu nu uh, x nu. This is the killing vector field for rotations, provided that m mu nu is an anti-symmetric matrix. So these generate the rotations for you. And in this language, um, you get um, rotation invariance of correlation functions. where if you have a tensor structure on these operators, if this OI, is, uh, this index I happens to be some kind of vector or spinorial or tensor index, then this Lie derivative, um, if you work out the details, automatically takes care of the rotation of the indices. And that's just a consequence of how the Lie derivative uh, works. So you get, um, for example, for um, this operator, this correlator star, you get also that it's a rotationally invariant function. So this g of x minus y becomes g of x minus y. x, mi x mu minus y mu becomes x mu x minus y squared. So this function is already constrained. It was an arbitrary function of x, arbitrary function of x and y, in fact. It becomes, by translation invariance, a consequence of, as a consequence of translation invariance, it becomes a function of their difference. And then, as a, fun a 
uh, as a, as a because of rotation invariance, it becomes a function of the square of their difference. There are no loose indices anymore. And of course, you can do the same thing for uh, vectors and for other correlation functions and so on. But the basic identities can be very easily derived from this, um, from this picture of, of diffeomorphism invariance and then applying that to a killing vector field. Okay, so this was really just a review of how to derive the word identities associated to um, isometries from um, a path integral perspective. Now in a general quantum field theory, it would basically be done now. There would not be many more symmetries for you to consider. And so if you want to find these correlation functions, for example, even something simple like a two-point function, you basically have to compute some arbitrary function here. There's a mass scale in the theory and, and the whole thing um, can, be, can really be some arbitrary function of uh, x minus y squared. But of course, we're not looking at arbitrary quantum field theories. We're looking at scale invariant theories. So we get an extra condition. which we can impose on our partition function. So what do we do? So we want to, do, we want to scale all the distances, right? We have a scale invariant theory, basically because we looked at the very longest of distances, so any sort of non-trivial renormalization group flow has run its course, and um, we're basically at the, at the fixed point of the renormalization group. So we want to scale all our distances, we have this, this this endpoint function and scaling all the distances up should be somehow a symmetry of sorts in our theory. One way to scale up all the distances is not by moving all the points, but instead by scaling the thing that measures the distances, the metric. So what we can do is we can demand that our partition function is invariant under rescalings of the metric. Um, <coughs> And maybe, of course, local operators will also have to scale. Um, so let's suppose that the fields scale like so. And let's suppose that this, well, let me call this delta tilde. Let me suppose that this is a symmetry also of the partition function, g mu nu phi r. And this delta tilde um, happens to be equal to delta for scalars for um, for vectors and, and other tensorial operators, it's a little different, but that's a, an unimportant distinction. Now, in fact, it turns out that if you look closely at scale invariant theories, this is not quite what happens. In fact, what happens is that um, there is some additional, extra, uh, additional term in the partition function, which is um, called the skill, or more commonly called the conformal anomaly. And so in unitary theories, in fact, you can show that um, uh, such an anomaly uh, <coughs> well, always, not always, often has to exist uh, by unitarity. And so um, it's, it's rare to have exact scale invariance. But this anomaly is just some small um, <coughs> um, um, modification from exact scale invariance. That is because this anomaly is very much constrained by um, locality and consistency conditions. And so the anomaly spoils the scale invariance a little bit, but not to the extent that it becomes completely incalculable. If this was a random thing, well, then there would not be scale invariance at all. This would just be two different expressions. So, but this, as it happens, is under control. And so um, that does not mean it's zero but I'll take it to be zero from now on. Um, because it will not matter for the kind of things that we'll be looking at. So um, in these lectures, we will ignore it. Although it's very important, for example, in two dimensions, this gives you the um, central extension of the Vera Zoro that, that differentiates the Vera Zoro algebra from the, the width algebra. So it's, it's an important thing, this anomaly. 
but I don't need it um, if I just want to find out what the constraints are on correlation functions of local operators. So, okay, we have another invariance condition and we can do the same spiel. We can go through the motions, we change the metric. So we said we do an infinitesimal one again, so we said lambda to be equal to 1 plus sigma, sigma infinitesimal, and we get some kind of condition. So we rescale the metric, that means we insert the stress tensor again, but then the difference in the metric delta g mu nu is just sigma times g mu nu. So we insert the stress tensor and then we contract it immediately with g mu nu, so we insert effectively the trace of the stress tensor, we contract the indices of, of the stress tensor. So at the level of correlation functions of local operators, and again this is something you can do, um, so let me do again the same endpoint function like so. We have a rescaling of the metric, we rescale the metric everywhere, so we have to integrate this like so. So that's the rescaling of the metric bit, and then we also scale the correlation, the operators, so we get um, the sources that will give me sum i equals 1 to n, sigma times delta tilde i times the same o i1 to o i n. And this is the constraint of scale invariance. On, well, this is, not, this is a constraint of scale invariance expressed in terms of correlation functions and the trace of the stress tensor. <coughs> so again, it's kind of a boring thing at this stage because it relates the correlation functions with the insertion of the trace of the stress tensor to correlation functions without the insertion of the trace of the stress tensor. And what we would like to have is a constraint on correlation functions without stress tensors proper so we can hopefully constrain this function, for example, and functions like this even further. So we have to do a little bit more work, but it's not that much. Because what we can do is we can say, well, let's look at this thing. If I have some kind of, um, so we'll, let me erase this. Let me clean this up a little bit. So I knew of x. So let's suppose I work in flat space. If I have some kind of vector field xi such that covariant derivative of xi is delta mu nu or g mu nu, then I have the trace of the stress tensor here that I can plug into there, and then I get altogether some constraint that just involves the correlation function of local operators. So how do, how do I do this? Well, um, I don't need any of this at the moment. Let me keep this middle board. So I want to say that, um, let's look at this, not in an arbitrary curved space, but let's just look at flat space, because that's what I'll be interested in eventually. So let me call this beast, um, I don't know, pound sign, um, and this thing, uh, in flat space, this thing is also, by virtue of this, um, <coughs> the integral over x square root g, box mu psi nu, t mu nu, and then o, o. But with the specific killing vector field psi nu s given by x nu. <coughs> right, because if I pick this particular vector field, it's not a killing vector field, if I pick this particular vector field, the scale vector field, psi nu equals x nu, then if I act with the derivative on it, I get the delta mu nu here. That gives me the trace of the stress tensor, and that's exactly what this thing is. Oh, there's a sigma, so let me add the sigma to psi, and now, we are, we have an exact equality, right? Does that make sense? So this left hand side here is the same as this, which I can therefore replace with the lead derivative acting on each of the operators. And so now I've gotten rid of the stress tensor insertion and I get um, 
So I say that this is also equal to minus the integral of x squared, or minus no integral, um, sum i equals 1 to n, and the lead derivative with respect to this particular scale vector field acting on operator or I, I, on each of the operators consecutively. Uh, I, And so together, um, if I plug, so this pound is equal to that, so I plug that in here, and then I get the constraint um, that relates Lie derivatives to rescalings in particular. Um, you get a rather simple looking equation. i equals 1 to n, uh, y i mu d d y i mu plus delta i uh, i i. So this now is the proper delta because um, I've, assume, I've absorbed a few, few additional terms in, in the leader, well, I've absorbed a few ad additional terms from the lead derivative in the transition from what I call delta tilde there to delta here. I don't want to go into the details of that. But eventually, you get precisely this, I1, Im. And so this is the constraint of scale invariance that we derived in maybe a slight, ra slightly roundabout way um, by, by going to this partition function, by discussing this partition function of the quantum field theory, this generating function of the quantum field theory in an arbitrary curved, um, on an arbitrary curved space. And so this constrains things even further, right? My two-point function of scalar operators, which was a function of, um, of the distance squared, has to obey this differential equation also. And uh, what you'll find if you solve it is that the solution is basically unique. So if there are two operators, it is x minus y to the power delta 1 plus delta 2. In a scale invariant theory. And so you see this, this freedom that we had that the correlation function of two operators could be um, an arbitrary function of the, of the, of the distance squared between them um, is completely gone. And all we have is this one little constant here that does not depend on x and y. And if you know this constant, you know this two-point function. So in fact, there's almost no information in this correlation function left because this constant is really just a normalization constant that I can get rid of um, by, by rescaling the operators. So. Um, So that's the story basically for, for two-point functions in the scale invariant theory. Any questions so far? Yeah? Um, the argument here is based on unitary division. Um, yes, there is unitarity. Do you know where I used it? So for arbitrary CFT. Yes, uh, it's a good point. I wanted to mention this and I forgot. Um, there is unitarity here. Um, so, so the argument here is just for only for the unitary conformal field uh, It's for unitary scale invariant theories. If you, for conformal field theories in a minute, we'll derive an even stricter condition. And then we'll also, well, in the next lecture, I wanted to make more clear what I mentioned with this, what, why, where unitarity snuck into this story, right? Because I had something. I assumed unitarity at some point. And so the, the, the point where it snuck in is basically this, this assumption, where I could rescale all my sources with some, some lambda, um, um, with some power delta. But what's this delta? Why is it a real number? 
right? Delta could be a complex number. And in fact, why do the operators transform homogeneously? If you think about the full list of operators and you have some rescaling operation on them, that could be some big matrix, why is it diagonalizable to this? And that is precisely where unitarity comes in. And only if I assume that this matrix is diagonalizable do I have the right to write this down, and then I get something like this. In fact, there are theories, so called logarithmic theories, where this, this matrix of dilatations has um, a Jordan block structure, and you get some logarithms in correlation functions, but these are never unitary. So the fact that these deltas are real and that these, this is sort of a diagonal operation on the set of operators is a consequence of unitarity. And so in a unitary theory, everything I said is true. In a non-unitary theory, you could have a much more complicated operation, and uh, things are uh, much nastier. Thanks. So, um, okay, this was just a scale invariant theory. We're almost there. We have almost fixed our two-point functions to the form that I want. But we're not quite there yet, because um, um, while we're talking about conformal field theories, and so far I've only said scale invariant theories. And we're not talking about scale invariant theories, we're talking about conformal theories. So what's the difference between scale and conformal? Where does that difference come from? So we have to talk a little bit about um, the enhancement from scale to conformal invariance. Now this is to some extent an experimental fact. It's not something, there are very strong arguments that every theory that scale invariance also possesses an extra symmetry called conformal invariance. Um, um, and sometimes in two dimensions, for example, it's watertight. In four dimensions, it's basically there modulo some very small assumptions. In three dimensions, I'm not aware of a, of a good proof. But it so happens that most of the scale invariant theories, unitary scale invariants that we look at, are also conformal invariant. And so where does this come from? Well, if you look at this equation and you suppose there are no other operating insertions for a second, then this right hand side is zero. And so you basically see that the integral of the trace of the stress tensor should just give you zero, away from other operator insertions. So, um, in fact, with, with almost no extra assumptions, you can, you can really prove this rigorously. So away from other operators, in a scale invariant theory, so a scale invariant quantum field theory, let me call it SFT, you find that t mu mu should, well, if the integral of it is zero, then either the thing is zero itself, or at the very least it's a total derivative. So let's just assume that it's a total derivative, at the very least. So this must be true. If you assume Noether's theorem, uh, really, it, it's, you can prove that it's true in a scale invariant theory. Um, but what is this, what would this J mu tilde be? It would be a thing that appears in the trace of the stress tensor, since the tr stress tensor has dimension d and scaling dimension, uh, dimension d, because it doesn't get an anomalous dimension, it follows that the dimension of this vector operator is d minus 1. And so a quick and dirty argument for the absence of J tilde, which is what I'd like to argue, is that um, there is just never such a vector, almost never such a vector operator. So you want a vector operator of exactly dimension d minus 1, but you go, you do your renormalization group analysis, for example, and you find already at one loop that everything that could possibly appear here um, is just um, gets an anomalous dimension that is non-zero. And then it's highly unlikely that at the longest possible distances you recover a vector operator that's exactly of the right dimension so that it can appear here on the right-hand side of this, uh, of this equation. So generically, this thing is, is just absent. There's no candidate operator uh, 
among the full list of operators that could play this role of, um, of such a, a vector operator. It's called the virial current, but um, it's not exactly um, a current because it's not, it's not quite conserved. Um, but people call it a, a virial current. Um, so typically, and that's all I want to say about this subject, you can find more in the references that I gave. Um, they give you further references um, with, with more details and proofs and so on. But typically it just so happens that J mu tilde is zero. There's no such operator, nothing is there. And so what really happens is that T mu mu is equal to zero again, away from other operators. So it's just zero um, <coughs> because there's no candidate operator that could be its trace in a scale invariant theory. And this is what buys us the extra symmetry that gives me, gets me from scale invariance to conformal invariance. Because if this thing is zero, then I might as well, and instead of a total derivative, I might as well consider position dependent sigma x here. And um, that thing just uh, drops out away from, from contact points. So um, <coughs> what this buys me <coughs> or at the very least what this is consistent with is um, invariance under much bigger class of transformations um, called well rescalings, where I let this sigma depend on the position. So um, g mu nu goes to lambda of x squared g mu nu, and uh, my operators phi i, well, they can also transform accordingly. So you see, this is a much bigger class because, because I can have an arbitrary lambda of x here. It's like an arbitrary diffeomorphism, but which, which, um, which also be, uh, um, had an arbitrary vector field in it. Um, so <coughs> this is typically what happens, although with the following caveat. So we had this story that uh, the phi's scaled homogeneously. Do I still have it? Uh, this one, delta tilde <coughs> minus d times phi. But in fact, this need not always be true now, because now we can do things like if lambda is position dependence, we can have d mu lambda terms, um, <coughs> then lambda to the appropriate power, and uh, phi, uh, some other operator, maybe phi mu, um, i, and something like that. So what you could have is that these operators transform in some complicated way um, where I have derivatives of lambda appearing. And maybe in a local theory you would expect finitely many, if these are local operators, you would expect finitely many derivatives to appear. But they could very well appear. And uh, nothing forbids me from having these derivatives. So that would complicate matters a little bit. And in the next lecture I'll discuss a little bit how to, um, a different viewpoint where we can deal with this more easily. Um, <coughs> Let's hire derivatives. But one thing we can do for now is just set all of this junk that we could get to zero. So if this phi tilde appears somewhere, then we just set that source to zero. And uh, we only consider um, sources, we only consider switching on sources for operators that transform homogeneously like this. So uh, for now, we will only consider phi i for operators that have a special name that are called primary operators. <laughs> and which by construction are such that the corresponding source um, transforms homogeneously with some power delta tilde minus t. Um, 
And so um, we now have to restrict ourselves to, to a certain class of operators. That the fact that these operators exist, that they can do this, all of that follows from unitarity and, and stuff that I'll discuss in the next lectures. But it turns out that it is true that you can do this. And maybe I should, for now, give these primary operators um, a little special designation. So let me write a little hat um, to denote primary operators. So let's then look at correlation functions of these, of these uh, primary operators. Um, then we have this skill ward identity. We have an arbitrary sigma of x. We have exactly this, except that we put some hats on it. But sigma of x can be arbitrary, so I might as well just integrate it out. So or take a functional derivative with respect to sigma and get rid of the derivative, get some delta functions instead. So what do I get? Um, let me write it here, although it's very similar to what I wrote. The insertion of the trace of the stress tensor um, with a bunch of primary operators is nothing but a rescaling at every point. So uh, some i equals 1 to n, delta x minus yi, delta tilde i y, and then the same correlation function. Like that. So this is the extra equation that I get, the non-integrated version of this equation. I get it for arbitrary x um, <coughs> that I get if my theory is invariant under well rescalings. In other words, if the trace of the stress tensor is exactly zero, away from, from uh, other operator insertions. So again, we have some identity that relates an insertion of the stress tensor to some other thing involving just the correlation function we want to get rid. Um, we want to use this um, to get the constraint on correlation functions itself, so we want to get rid of the insertion of the, of the stress tensor. Um, and we have to combine this again with the diffeomorphism, uh, the diffeomorphism word identity I unfortunately erased. But um, if we combine it with an appropriate diffeomorphism, then we can get a constraint on correlation functions. So what do we do? Um, well, we look for the eraser, which is all the way on the other end. So just as for skill transformations, we only need to, we need to consider um, special vector fields that do the job of inserting the trace of the stress tensor. So, um, and these vector fields are called conformal killing vector fields, CKV. <coughs> conformal killing uh, vector field which by definition obeys the constraint that CKV knew the change in the metric if you perform a diffeomorphism along this vector field CKV is equal, is proportional to the metric itself times perhaps some rescaling which are called 2 sigma of x. Of course you can take the trace of this equation and then you find that sigma of x is just um, 1 over d times the divergence of your conformal killing vector field. That was not so hard to deduce. So there are a bunch of vector fields. So this is an equation for, for vector fields. And so there are a bunch of vector fields that obey this. In particular, the translations obey this with sigma equals 0. And the rotations obey this with sigma equals 0. Um, the dilatations, where uh, we had our skill vector field, uh, where psi nu in flat space is equal to x nu, they obey this with um, sigma constant. And um, those are the examples of conformal killing vector fields that we, um, that we found. And then we can again, for conformal killing vector fields, we can again 
combine um, the diffeomorphism word identity with this well invariant word identity. Um, we see here um, a transformation, something that just involves the operators. We see here the trace of the stress tensor, but we can make that. Um, we can use the diffeomorphism invariants to uh, relate that to Lie derivatives as before, and so we find um, a new condition for um, uh, for the correlation function itself, which is something like covariance along conformal killing vector fields. So then combine everything I wrote with um, all the previous, some of the previous equations to get. And if you don't see it, uh, um, maybe you can ask me later, or I hope you took notes, and then you can do it yourself uh, very easily. But what you get is uh, the following covariance condition. So here you see the sigma, which is basically um, one over d times the divergence of uh, the killing of the of the conformal killing vector field. So this CKV, CKV, um, which now acts on each of the operators O i, y i, O i n, y n, like so. And so this is, in a conformal field theory, the most general conformal word identity um, that correlation functions of local operators have to obey. Um, <coughs> in fact, in any, in any curved space, but of course we're mostly interested in flat space eventually, so all of these things simplify. But this is a constraint that must be obeyed in any, in any curved space. So what are the conformal killing vector fields? <coughs> Any vector field that obeys that equation that I wrote before, there are not so many, as it happens in most space-time dimensions. So um, you should ask at this point, well, if this is my most general equation, then uh, I better know, I better find out what all the conformal killing vectors uh, are in flat space. And so, of course, the translations do the job of obeying this equation. The translations are very easy. Uh, xi is constant, and it's just zeros. The rotations, again, uh, the left-hand side and therefore the right-hand side are, are, are zero. Um, we have this. So um, these are basically d mu. These are x nu, d mu minus x mu d nu. We have the skill, killing, the skill vector fields, skill transformations. They're also called dilatations, which is x mu d mu. So that gives rise to the skill word identity. That one we already solved. In fact, we solved the word identity for each of those. Um, <coughs> and it's, it happens in, um, in more than two space-time dimensions, there's one more class, which are the so-called special conformal transformations. And so this is an extra vector field under which our correlation functions um, should also transform uh, covariantly in this manner. Um, and the vector field for those is minus x squared d mu plus 2 x mu x mu d mu. And in fact, I should mention at this point that in two space-time dimensions, there are infinitely many more conformal killing vector fields. But, um, but let's uh, for now focus on um, space-time dimensions three and higher. So um, 
And then this is the full list of conformal killing vector fields. So the full set of invariance conditions for your uh, correlation function. So let's see if our two-point functions of scalar operators is invariant under this new transformation that we have derived under special, so-called special conformal transformations. So it's a bit of a weird vector field. It's a bit of a weird transformation. Um, <coughs> there are various ways of, of explaining it, but um, I don't have the time now. Maybe I'll do so tomorrow. What, what kind of diffeomorphism uh, this induces. Um, for now, let's just check um, for the two-point function of scalars. And I should now say that these are primary scalars because otherwise this term here would be, would be wildly different. But if they're primary, this is, this is the, the right term. So the two-point function of primary scalars in flat space, as usual, we, had, um, we have to say, check that the invariance under this conf special conformal killing vector field, so let me call this, um, uh, okay, let me call this uh, killing vector field psi special conformal transformation. I don't want to write it out again. So you just get uh, psi special conformal transformation mu d mu plus 2 delta i xi mu uh, mu goes up. Like so, acting on O1 of x, O2 of y should equal to zero. Uh, x1 and x2 is what I would So maybe I d d x mu i x y x1 x2. So this is the proper way. And this should be true. And of course, we already got pretty far with the other conformal killing vector fields. So we already know that this is C12 over x minus y to the delta 1 plus delta 2. And so what do we get? Well, you can work this out. It's very easy. I give you all the um, um, ingredients. So what you will get is that 0 is equal to C12. That constant, of course, comes out in front. Uh, delta 1 minus delta 2, which happens in some funny way, but it's not so hard to derive. And then something that is definitely not 0. So it's just uh, x minus y to some power and maybe some other stuff that, uh, that's unimportant. But this has to equal 0 if we are in a bona fide conformal field theory and we have bona fide conformal invariance. So what must happen is that either one of these two terms is 0. So we see that C12 is 0 unless uh, <coughs> delta 1 is equal to delta 2. And so in a conformal field theory, we have an additional constraint that the two-point function of scalar operators L1, O2 of x2 is C12 delta Some kind of Kronecker delta, which says that the operators have to be of equal dimension, 2 delta 1, and then the power is just 2 delta 1. And this is um, as far as you can get with the, with the conformal ward identities for the two-point functions of, um, of, uh, of scalars. So we've now, by hand, so we've found all the ward identities. I've, I've written them down in a sense that makes sense for all the correlation functions individually. And um, <coughs> um, we've checked that um, for the two-point function of scalars, this is the, the solution. And the only freedom left here is the C12, which is now really seen to be just normalization. But in fact, the way I've set things up, you can derive, of course, the constraint of conformal invariance for other correlation functions as well. So for three-point functions and four-point functions and so on. <coughs> 
Um, I am completely out of time, but uh, what can I do? I would like to say a little bit about, let, can I have one minute? I, I, I'd, I'd like to add, of course you can, you can solve these conformal ward identities now and see what the constraint is of conformal invariance for arbitrary correlation function. So for example, you can do this same exercise that I implicitly did for the two-point functions of two scalars. You can do it for the two-point function of a, of, a, of a vector operator or the two-point function of a tensor operator. And you'll find constraints again and you'll find that these um, two-point functions are always uniquely fixed up to a constant. But you can also do like three-point functions of scalars. Three-point functions of scalars in a general quantum field theory are very difficult objects and they're, um, <coughs> they're, they're in principle some arbitrary function that is consistent with rotations and translations. In a conformal field theory for three-point functions of primary operators, um, <coughs> the answer is in fact extremely simple. So if I take three, let's say, scalar primary operators, I'd like to do general tensors, but I'm out of time. Then um, the conformal ward identities, um, so this whole structure that I just derived, tells you that this thing is completely fixed. x12 to the delta 1 plus delta 2 minus delta 3. And it looks like this, delta 3 minus delta 2, x23 to the delta 2, delta 3 minus delta 1. And in fact, for the three-point function of primary scalars, the only ambiguity that you're left with is the overall constant here, which I can call lambda 1, 2, 3. And so at the level of two-point functions and three-point functions, correlation functions of uh, local operators are really just characterized um, up to some normalizations by the C, but if you set the Cs to 1 by appropriate normalizations, they're just characterized by these deltas, these scaling dimensions of operators and the lambdas here, which are, um, once you've normalized the thing with their two-point functions, the lambdas are observable numbers um, that, that sit in the three-point functions. So, um, so this, of course, is a massive simplification if you compare this to, to other quantum field theories. There are no arbitrary functions anymore. They're just deltas and lambdas. And um, what I'd like to do, what I'd like to work my way towards is uh, set up some kind of framework called the bootstrap that tells you, um, gives you constraints on these deltas of these lambdas that just, again, follow from very general consistency conditions. So that's where I'll hope to go in lecture two, three, and four. So thank you. Well, so in instead of a special conformal transformers of scaling, so uh, there is no I mean, uh, vector operator whose dimension is d minus one. So that's why uh, this, uh, we can put uh, this uh, trace equals to zero. So is there any physical reason why this is happening? Um, I think you're asking about my next lecture. So you're saying that special conformal transformations reduce the dimension? Um, Right, so you want to say that um, the dimension cannot be arbitrarily negative or cannot be negative. Yes, um, so, okay, we'll get there in the next lecture, but the answer is um, at this level, uh, just cluster decomposition. So I'm, I'm, I, I think if you grant me cluster decomposition, you don't even have to grant me uh, unitarity. Uh, then at large deltas, at large distances, um, I'd like my correlation function to go to zero. And so that tells me that these deltas, maybe they're still complex numbers, but at least the real part has to be, has to be positive. And so you cannot act infinitely, many oft, infinitely often with a special conformal transformation on an operator. Thank you. Okay, uh, let's thank the speaker again. And we meet uh, at 3.40.